Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing on Transformation Friday. Um, today, we have a, a wonderful uh, speaker and guest, uh, John Willis, from the Office of Global Transformation here at Red Hat. Um, you probably know him as Bacha Galupa. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, that's correct. Uh, yeah, there you go. And um, from his work in DevOps and the Phoenix Project. So today, he's going to... Um, walk us down an alley. I think that um, I've watched him do qualitative data analysis from lots of notebooks and notes and post-it stickers and all kinds of things. But um, how we take that and turn that process and use some computer uh, assisted methods to do this as well and how you can take that into your organization. So I'm going to let John introduce himself, introduce the topic. There'll be time at the end for um, live Q&A. Um, just ask in the chat. And um, with that, John, take it away. Great. Thank you, Dan. It's, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, fancy title, Qualitative Data Analysis for Digital Transformation. Um, so I'll go through why, you know, why why this title, you know, my sort of experience of, of um, it's something I've been doing for, for um, probably three or four years now. And uh, it just isn't until recently I've I've gotten more sort of academic and prescriptive, and that's primarily because I, I now work with uh, Jay Bloom, <laughs> who has a PhD in design transition, and so he helps me a lot of showing me a lot of the stuff I have been doing over the years, um, and how it actually is um, can be enhanced through some well-known techniques and processes. Um, anyway, um, if you've been paying attention on Fridays, you've probably seen these uh, the four of us. Um, we're called the Global Transformation Office. That's Andrew Clay Schaefer, and that's Kevin Bear, who's co-author of the Phoenix Project. That's me, the short guy, and then Jay Bloom, who I just talked about. Uh, Andrew likes to say we wrote the books or wrote some books, I guess. Uh, you know, Kevin Phoenix Project. I did a collaborative, collaborative uh, project with Gene called Beyond the Phoenix Project. I was co-author of DevOps Handbook. In fact, we're talking about the five-year anniversary. Coming up next year, book, so a revise, so pay attention. Um, Andrew wrote some chapters, web operations, site reliability, um, and Kevin was one of the original authors of Visible Ops. Um, I was an advisor on the Unicorn Project. I'm not really credited as an author, but um, just quickly on myself, again, if you don't know who I am, um, I've spoken a couple of times on Fridays. I'm part of GTO, but um, I just listed a, a couple of the sort of publications I've worked on. I think I've you know, back in the day, I used to write IBM Red books. I probably have 10 or 11 books in my resume over many years. Uh, but uh, the two I think are really interesting. I'm not going to get into today. Normally, I talk about automated governance. And so uh, there's uh, two papers that are out there, IT Revolution and Cloud Governance for ONAR. And both of those are um, Creative Commons. And then um, I've only sort of listed the last 12 years. I've worked for a lot of companies. I think I've done like 10 startups. and. Uh, but I was sold the company to Docker. I was uh, actually started my career at Exxon. Uh, I would say Red Hat now. Sold the company to Dell. All good stuff. So one of the things that um, you know I've been doing this an awfully long time, right? Like I, my my career spans. You know, I, I wrote IBM mainframe assembler code. Uh, you know, back in the '80s, right? <laughs> so and I got I went through the first sort of uh, distributed computing, um, and then I spent many years. Um, Supporting a, a reasonably successful uh, services company based on the Tivoli portfolio, so we the first crack at distributed computing, and then I moved into the open source world with Chef and you know Puppet Chef and you know all the other great things, including Thin Cloud. So this this notion of how do you help people improve, right? Like this is the this is the uh, the golden ticket, if you will. Um, how do you know? And and so um, about three or four years ago, I left Docker to become independent, and I was really working as a one-person shop. I had one salesperson myself. And I went in, and I had this whole notion that, like, I was going to use all these sort of prescriptive ideas that I had learned and used and, you know, learned from a lot of sort of uh, friends. You know, being in, in sort of Gene Kim's tribe, if you will, you get to meet, like, leaders across some of the biggest industries. They're all friends of mine. Um, and one of the things I started finding out is I, I started sort of de-evolving my practice pretty quick. You know, I, I, like, for example, I would come in with lean value stream mapping to do this. And, and I realized there was a lot of other stuff that I really wanted to get to, you know, the thing about truth. But I needed to understand about your organization that these frameworks got in the way. 
you know, and, and I, you know, I'm a big fan and I'll just call them frameworks. I'm not sure what you call them, but things like lean value stream mapping. I think it's an incredible tool. I think it's the worst tool to start with. Um, and I'll explain why. Um, and, you know, um, horizon based stuff or a zone in the wind. I don't know. It's maybe eventually I'll agree with it. I think it could be used in appropriate, whatever. So the second sort of, um, you know, thing that I think gets in the way of transformation is this sort of impersonal, like some large organization comes in and says, these are the five things you need to do, or you can't do agile unless you co-locate or, yeah, I mean, just these like ridiculous, not ridiculous, they're, they're, they're based on industry doctrine. But the reason I go in personal was not, you're not asking or including the people who are going to be affected by the change in the change. And last is the notion of mental models. And I'll go through each one of these really quickly, right? Which is, um, you know, everybody has these different mental models. You know, you think about, you know, like in criminology, right? The, the, the famous stories of, you know, three witnesses to a crime. And when they go to get the, you know, what they look like, one said they had red hair, the other one said they were blonde hair, um, you know. Um, so, so in getting, uh, looking at these three, right? I was, this is something I've always said, you know, in fact, I, I came to this conclusion when I started decoupling my practice, you know, the idea that I was going to do all these frameworks is you can't lean agile safe or DevOps or SRE or, you know, uh, zone to win or whatever you way around a bad organizational culture, right? You like, you literally have to get some understanding of what the organization from the people, I say the people at the edge, the people who do the work. Uh, second is I, 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 I did an interview with Christina Maslach, who is the, the uh, foremost organizational burnout expert in, in the industry. She's written books. They've named a, a canonical test. It's got her name in it, the MBI, Maslach Burnout Inventory. And so I, this, she made a comment in a podcast. So I took that as a quote. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's whenever we're talking about any kind of change or improvement and you're counting on a bunch of human beings to make the change, to make this happen, if they haven't been part of figuring out how to do it, the change efforts will be down. So you have to, at some point, include the input of the people who are going to be affected by the change. But we don't do that a lot in our industry. And third is this notion of mental models. We go back to Peter Senge, the fifth discipline, uh, pretty much the, uh, the father of system thinking. You know, mental models are deeply held, internal images of how the world works, images that that uh, limit us to familiar ways of thinking and acting. Very often we are not um, consciously aware of our mental models and, um, you know, in, in the, no, sorry, I just, uh, and, and affect the way we think. So the, the, the net net is that um, these mental models actually get in our way when we're trying to transform because different people, I did an exercise once where I was talking to an organization and it was a group of people and I asked three people, that worked on the same service, worked together to go into three different rooms and whiteboard their service, you know, how it looked. And, and you wouldn't be surprised that they were all different. I mean, they all had the same general idea, right? Uh, so this idea that people, um, you know, mental models sort of have the, you know, my concept of something, even words, taxonomy in an organization. Uh, you know, people who go into meetings with, going in and the intent like the meeting is about compliance right and you know everybody in the room or at least there might be three different definitions of compliance of the people in the room and nobody knows that and so the meeting really didn't really go anywhere um so so then i talked about qualitative data now so i think it's important to, to quickly mention the difference between sort of quantitative approach which has been taken in sort of devops and transformation and um, a qualitative approach that I'm, I'm sort of suggesting or I've been using and I, I think it works really well. So in a quantitative, you, you start with a generalized theory and you use correlation to specific conclusions. Um, it's it's um, inductive deductive, if you will, right? So um, it draws specific conclusions from general principles or premises. It's uh, typically numeric, right, statistics, um, and it usually is either, you know, in our industry, it's been surveys. So we'll talk about some of the surveys. Um, it's impersonal, like a survey is impersonal. You don't, like when you're taking a survey, you don't get to ask, well, what does that mean? Or what if the answer depends, right? Uh, and, and it's close-ended, right? So there's sort of, there always is one answer. It's either strongly disagree or strongly agree and somewhere in between, 
or it's a multiple choice, you know, I deploy between six months and a year. Well, I got multiple services, what do I do? Um, and so, um, so let's take an example. So probably the canonical quantitative approach that's been used in DevOps, which has been very successful, is the DORA, um, now it's Accelerate, it's, you know, with, um, and um, which has been a psychometric survey um, to, there's, there's a number of patterns that are addressed, and I don't wanna just limit it, but in, in general, the industry has accepted the fact that there are basically four variables that we look at um, and we sort of describe organizational performance based on these. So the idea was that the authors of these surveys, um, and there's multiple ones, but you know the most prominent one is, is Nicole Fortran and Jez, well, and uh, and uh, Gene Kim. Sorry, I can't believe I almost forgot his name. Um, and um, and so the theory would be that um, if you have shorter lead time, you have more frequent deploys, you have a, a lower change fail rate, and you have a quicker uh, time to restore. Um, that, that you're more likely uh, a high performance organization and vice versa for a low, low organization, right? And so for six years, I think seven years now, um, the, the idea is to collect a lot of data through surveys and sort of prove that theory out or inductive that, that, you know, that you know, and then you'll see things like, you know, um, high performing organizations are 100 times faster in lead time than low performing organizations, right? And uh, so like, for example, um, how often do you deploy? More than six months, you know, between month and, uh, or, and so again, um, I'll, I'll do the pros and cons here in a minute, but the point is, if I have more than one answer, tough. If I don't know what you meant by on demand, I can't ask you, uh, right? So, um, you, know, in, in, you know, and I don't know, um, I don't know the context of your specifics. Are you like a one person? Are you, are you a digital, sort of side project in a large, you know, 80,000 company that you're the only person that maintains it and, um, in, in, you know, in your thing and you deploy all the time. Is that representative of that organization, right? Um, you know, a large bank. And so the pros of a, of a quantitative approach is it's definitely easy to administer, right? It's, I can administer thousands. I mean, it's harder to administrate in a company. I will, I've tried that. And in fact, it's why I went to a qualitative approach. I, I found that a quantitative approach uh, inside an organization was a very difficult. I'll save that for another presentation. But you get more data. You know, again, the industry surveys have been very effective for us in our industry, right? Finding out general theories of things like, you know, how high performers work versus low performance. It's helped us sort of gauge initial ways to uh, create outcomes as more data it is objective and it is based on a scientific method the cons like i said is impersonal i can't ask you i can't look at your face and see that you didn't understand my question or i can't drill down on the question or you can't ask me the answer is depends close-ended um, i would say it's theoretical as opposed to empirical which i which i'll explain when i get to Qualitative, and like I said earlier, it is uh, content specific. Now, qualitative, right, is um, it moves away from theory driving the data to an approach where the data drives the theory, right? So it's abductive, right? It's uh, you know, like, uh, Jay says uh, that I did create it's like it's like a murder mystery. So in sort of the qualitative is what what, what Jay would say is um, inductive deductive. I think I read it right, which is you're really going to come out with an answer. Whereas um, abductive is, or abductive, inductive, or inductive abductive, sorry, um, is, um, is basically more like a murder mystery, right? I, I've got to sift through a lot of different ways of you telling me stuff. And, and again, I think that, to me, that's the power. Because these, the complexity of these organizations are just, they're just too complex to create one single answer from, you know, or 50 answers to 50 questions. Um, they're categorical. Like, so here again, what we're trying to do is, decouple the mental models, right? So what we're saying is like, if I, if I can look at the answers to interview questions from multiple people, right? I might have, you know, through an abductive process, be able to get a better understanding of what this really means. And I can roll things up and I'll show you examples here. Uh, it's interpersonal. Again, I can go back and forth. I can, you can ask me what the heck do you mean by that. I can say, do you know what I mean by that? And it's open-ended. 
So, so as opposed to sort of an industry doctrine based on a quantitative approach that's been used, like the sort of door accelerate, um, you know, lead time, MTT, those things. I would say, and this is what I use, I actually have seven, I call it seven deadly sins, but I would say that most organizations that I have worked with and been in and interviewed or just based on our gen my general industry experience or even sort of uh, my collaborative experience with other people is that most companies struggle with invisible work, visibility, consistency, capacity, and toil issues, right? So in this qualitative approach or my approach now is that um, I'm going to basically sort of set these, like these are the things I'm just going to try to tease out. And I actually have seven and I'll show you them a little later. Um, and, and I'm going to tease these out. And then, um, and so here's an example, like a question might be, what is the audit process like in your organization? One person might say, you're terrible, you know, they're, or you're horrible. Another person might say, you know, they waste about 30 times a year. And then this is the one I love the best, right? Which is, we don't tell orders things they don't already know because so it, it allows me to, to well, here, here's the sort of pros and cons is, you know, it's empirical, it's, it's, um, it, it's, 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 I, I can, I can use um, multiple observations to, um, to drive through the, um, the process of understanding what they're saying. I can link things together, um, you know, so, um, you know, it's verifiable observations, it's open-ended. Uh, I, I would say it's combinatorial, right? So going back to mental models, right? I, I can, um, you know, I can use the objective example of trying to figure out like, hey, you know, this person said this. And even more importantly, like, for example, overloaded tone, current term, sorry, um, something like compliance. I, you know, I find that um, a lot of organizations and different organizations have different meanings for things like governance, risk, and compliance, individual meanings. And then even in the organization itself, they might have their name. One group might call everything risk, another might call everything uh, compliance. So if I'm having these conversations or these interview processes, I can actually take notes and figure out what I thought you meant for compliance, what it really means in an industry perspective versus person three, four, five, and six. And then through the, um, the rigor of the qualitative approach, which I'll talk about in a minute, I can actually create, um, you know, I, I, I can come up with a theory that I believe company X, you know, one word for this type of thing is um, risk. And here's how it's addressed, right? Obviously harder to administrate, less data, and it is subjective, but at the end of the day, like all of these process, processes are sort of um, inductive in the sense that you're, you're um, you know, there's some subjectivity like to the, you know, again, there's more rigor in crunching numbers and doing statistical analysis and clustering and all the things. But at the end of the day, there's the sort of con of the sort of, uh, it isn't uh, verifiable observations. Um, so here's an example really quick of, of so I, I'm gonna show you a, a tool that I fell in love with. It's called Max QDA, Max Qualitative Data Analysis. There's a category of tools called Computer Assisted um, Qualitative Data Analysis. And uh, just if you look really quick, you load in all the interviews and, um, and the, uh, what you'll call it, um, and then you um, you basically start tagging different um, what they call coding different areas. So the approach I've been using here is uh, called grounded theory. Um, it is multiple theory. And again, I'm not going to sort of profess dying like a you know sort of a PhD on qualitative analysis. I've I've read uh, read a lot about it and I fortunately have uh, Jabe to help me understand this, but this is the approach I use. And so this approach, um, the implementation approach is really using the qualitative data, the interviews. So basically I take all, all the interviews that I do, um, you know, take the transcripts and then notes, and then I load them in as artifacts, including lots of other stuff like letters and um, sort of notes from, from emails that people sent about the process. And then you do this, this thing called coding, where you basically go ahead and um, you, you, you sort of highlight, like you saw on that last screen, and then you assign a, sort of a, a, a temporary, in my case, I would call a temporary def, definition to it. And then you roll through what are called concepts, categories, which then you get to sort of out. So think about the industry dockering is how I sort of start, and it's my sort of industry, um, 
roadmap or um, recommendations is how I ground it. So what I'm doing is I sort of know the things that are generally wrong with the company, and I know the things that generally should be done to fix a company. What I don't know is how to connect that to the data that's driven by the organization, and I do that through a qualitative data analysis process. So, so what you see here, the, the idea is codes are key observations, concepts are groupings of simpler codes, categories. So there's this roll-up process. So the interesting thing is, when I sit down with a CIO and they ask me, um, you know, well, John, I don't know if I agree with this. You know, I can say, well, you know, okay, we can walk back through the category, the concept, and we can actually find the paragraph or the sentence of what was said about this. Now, I always delete names and I always sort of do the aggregate, but like, it, it's a beautiful process when you get disagreement CIO, like, you know, I one of my famous is your audits are theater, like your audits are terrible. They don't really connect the dots. And oh, no, John, I'm not gonna accept that. And like, okay, you know, let me show you like, 10 examples of why I came up with this. And this is, to get back to the data. Like, it's not XYZ Corp coming in and saying, like, we're smarter than you, do these five things, and you'll be successful. It's like, I have an idea of what's wrong with you. Let me listen to all your, let me follow the data, which is basically interviewing a bunch of your people, and then I'll tie that to sort of industry doctrine and solutions. You know, so here's an example of a grounded theory. You know, I, I, you saw this earlier, but now I've got it attached to the sort of methodology, right? The code might be the sentence that somebody said in answer to a question. The concepts are audits are inefficient. The category is risk. And then in this case, the, um, the recommendation might be automated governance. So I can walk in and say, you should do automated governance, right? Like, and I'm probably gonna be right nine out of 10 times, or I'm say like eight out of 10 times. But now I have absolute like confirmation. And to go back to the, the other thing too is, the, going back to the um, sort of the impersonal, right? Like now people feel like they were, so if the, if the organization comes in and says, we're doing automated governance because we listened to you and we heard that audits are terrible, you know, and they're really hard and they waste a lot of time, everybody involved is like, yeah, no, that was our input, awesome. Right, as opposed to um, a big four coming in and say you must do automated governance, and then all of a sudden they're doing all this stuff, and it's like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, nobody asked me. And so, um, so the, the the I told you that I had like seven. I like the number seven. It works good for presentations. <laughs> like it could have been six. It could have been eight. Um, but basically, these are the ones where I I I find over my experience over the years that um, I can decouple or or go through sort of in inductive process by navigating around these ideas. Invisible work, multiple mission, system toil, like you might have five or six different systems to manage tickets, uh, alignment, knowledge alignment, you know, sort of the Brent syndrome, organizational design, complex system, security and compliance. Um, you know, and, and some of you see my presentation, Seven Deadly Sins of DevOps, basically it's, I consider it a funnel that typically drives the, the worst and deadliest sin of them all, um, basically security and compliance theory. Again, I have longer presentations on this thing. So, so the approach then is um, that I've been taking with an engagement is we have some original conversations. I do the assessment, analyze report, and then really help try to figure out how to do the transformation. So um, meetings, you know, pre-COVID, you know, I've done them all virtual, but pre-COVID, you know, with a large engagement, the largest engagement I ever did was a top five bank, I spent a month on site, I interviewed like 300 people, probably closer to 50 meetings. Um, I, I, I can calculate the amount of minutes of, um, of transcriptions and uh, probably well north of 50 documents, right? But now virtually I've been doing this with organizations where we'll do like 90 minute meetings with the team. Um, so maybe 10 meetings overall over a three week period, 80, whatever, right? So it all depends. But again, the, the virtual is, is I, I didn't think it was gonna work virtual. It has actually worked really well. The, the only question is it just works better when I can be in a room with a team for the whole day. Um, typically the way it works is there's some executive letter. It's gotta have executive, like it, it, it has to be, um, it usually has to be a CIO who's buying into this because the other ones have to tell people, I really want you to, like this idea, like I want you to go in the room with this guy, <laughs> this Bacho guy, and I really, 
if all possible, don't bring your laptop, right? Like, unless the place is on fire or whatever, but I really don't want you sort of in and out. I, I Like for, you know, for a couple of weeks or a week or 90 minutes virtual, I want you to just be focused. Um, there's an engagement of interest uh, response, which is brilliant. One of the clients that I go with came up with this. A lot of these ideas, every time I do one, the client gives me better ideas. But the idea where you, you know, the CIO says, I think, you know, these, um, you know, 15 people should definitely go. And then let's open it up in a letter to say, hey, we're going to do this. Who'd like to go? And then people have to write sort of a response to an engagement. Um, and then I get to use that to identify you beforehand. It, it really works well. And um, then usually there's electronic notes, audio transcripts. Um, some cases, uh, it always works better when I can sort of record and throw away. I, I don't really use the audio. I just need the transcripts. Um, so, and then there's this number of, there are people that I identify during the process that I get back and I think, I really want to talk to that person, Bob or Sue. And uh, so I usually do sort of these uh, post um, one-on-ones. The analysis, um, you sort of, sort of the process. Um, Again, like this is an example, one that was about 80 people. It was um, like 20 documents. So you can see I have all the interview notes. I have I usually have two scribes, have myself taking specific notes, and then I have somebody else who's actually a scriber. And so I've got, you know, I've got the transcript, I've got the scriber, and then I've got my sort of additional notes. And this tool, uh, and I'm, I, I'm gonna come back maybe um, in, in, at another time and just do a whole, um, presentation on how to, I, I've got this um, thing I've been doing with doing a postmortem on the Equifax breach using this tool. Uh, I'm going to write it up. It's, it's really cool. I mean, like, um, like the, the power of this tool. So, uh, you know, um, it, it just has just everything you need to know. I'm just going to give you a little sense. You know, one of the things I'll do uh, sort of at some point after I've loaded a bunch of documents, I'll do some quick word mapping. So it has a lot of really powerful features for word mapping. I can get, I can whitelist terms and stuff. And then, um, and then uh, there's, uh, so then I can, there's another screen I had here where I can do it ordered and I can see what the, uh, you know, how many words, which are the words that, um, in a, just sort of a tabular list. So I can actually start identifying words that really have meaning. And that helps me in the taxonomy. So this all helps me to sort of build that taxonomy discussion, right? Um, but then, like I said earlier, there's this um, you know kind of coding exercise where you go in and you read through. You've already done the interview, so you're so sort of context sensitive in your head, and then you basically start identifying um, these codes with particular maybe risk, design, different different areas. And the idea is, even though I start off with these seven patterns, the seven deadly sins, I really don't know what is going to emerge from the data. So I'm not. I'm not uh, stuck with those. I really literally try to free, and it's hard, but I f try to free my head to say, um, you know, I'm not going to try to assume any solutions. I'm not going to try to assume that they have consistency. And even in the first couple of rounds, I really try not to, to do a whole lot of uh, categorization. Uh, and then, you know, and then the tool becomes incredibly powerful in terms of the coding. Here's an example where, um, you know, sort of risk, design, consistency. These are the ones that just showed up all the time. You can see that consistency and design came up like most frequently on the right. And uh, and here's another sort of example of a sort of a population of the codes. And, and then there's all sorts of tools here um, that can be very powerful. I'm still learning a lot about the tool. Um, but there's these ways to do these sort of casing models, incredible graphics. So here's an example of now once I've got all the codes, I can say, look at um, sort of structurally or graphically what's going on in this. It's called the single cost model. Like so that there's sort of, um, and all these things are linked to each other. So I can go back and forth. I can, you know, this is a really good example. So um, I can compare the notes to the transcript, right? So the transcript, even the best transcript is sort of, like will mangle certain words. So I can get a sort of a gap analysis of what, um, you know, and the, the other thing I look for there too is like if the scribe was like, you know, distracted or something, what maybe there was something missed and I might be able to dive back into it. I've learned, um, you know, like I said, the more I do this, the more I learn. I used to wait and get all the data and load it in. That was kind of stupid. Now I do it after each interview and I do a postmortem with the scribe so I can actually start with this quick, um, you know, hey, wait a minute, wasn't there a story around, um, 
you know, sort of, um, you know, just pick something, you know, projects were really bad and project management was bad there. And then we can, oh yeah, I forgot, I didn't capture that, right? Uh, this is just another way to look at the data. Uh, and then just, you know, like, like, there's only a certain extent that the graphics really help, but it does help in presentation mode. Uh, like here is sort of drilling in on risk. And then here again, um, sort of reducing codes, there's a lot of, uh, they call it a retrieve segments. So now I can sort of say, I don't see anything other than risk. And then so in that bottom section, I can go through all documents, everything, the 20 documents, the 100,000 sort of a novel basically, if you will. Um, I mean, I'm crazy. I, you know, I, we're doing a review for this five year anniversary DevOps handbook. I'm gonna actually load the DevOps handbook in here and I'm gonna do my review in here. Cause you, you can attach notes. I mean, it's just really cool. Uh, just quickly, um, I don't, I'm not gonna go through the gory, gory details of this, but so then as part of that process, you start, you know, sort of applying thematic observations. Again, I said, you start with sort of your generalized industry doctrine. Like I know that like visibility and consistency and capacity and, tip and toil typically issues. I know that um, there are certain other things that I know there's a set of patterns that I think you should apply. And I'll show you that in my sort of list that I usually, but what I need to do is I need the ground to that, right? And and then along the way, I get to sort of look at like, are there these thematic, are these things that pop up? You know, we typically will say, well, the problem in any pattern to DevOps is trust. Well, yes, that's true. But like, let me find it in the data, you know, that um, your lead time, you know, again, um, it, it's it's difficult for me being involved in sort of the DevOps movement since the its inception and walking to a large bank today and talk about getting a VM in four weeks or, uh, you know, getting storage in three weeks. And I mean, I've heard recently, I've heard this, uh, like, it takes two minutes to spin up an Amazon instance, it takes another two weeks to use it, right? <laughs> like, what are we doing, folks? Um, you know, how many active projects, like, okay, everybody's telling me there are too many active projects and nobody knows where they all are and where they are. And, uh, you know, like, I, I think one of another kind of quotes I got recently, which was, um, I don't, I have dependency, you know, that's dark, what I call dark dependencies, like where you, you have all these dependencies, you're coupled with all these dependencies, other services, and you, um, but you don't like know anything about their status, right? And so the, this, this notion of sort of a dark dependency or dark workflow. And so somebody said to me, like, I don't know for certain dependencies that are critical path for me, I don't know if it's gonna take two days or two weeks. So at scale, that's just like how do you how do you even manage flow with that, right? Um, I mean, if I knew it was two weeks, great. Uh, funding is always an issue. And then um, you know what I try to do through that categorization process is say, okay, I mean now we're actually sort of borderline quant uh, quantitative, but I uh, one way I try to figure out like how am I going to tell this client which are the things that are the probably the what I heard the most. So then I'll, I'll literally look at the categories and sort of from the roll-ups from the codes to the concepts to the categories. So you know what? Out of all these, the sort of consistency was the number one thing we heard. Uh, but here's, I can drill down on all these sort of uh, evidence, if you will, on funding and toil. Um, and then sort of look at these as like, how do we sort of address these? And uh, so at the end of the day, these are all the um, concepts you know, based on sort of, or the elements of the category. Um, again, uh, we don't have time to go through all of these. Um, and then, um, and then so what I have come up with, again, liking sevens, I like sort of the seven uh, DevOps opportunities, which are, um, you know, uh, uh, just taxonomy and models, right? The most organizations just are terrible with just common taxonomy. You know, sometimes it is simple as, Say, why don't we take these 10 words that everybody's using and make sure we all understand exactly what they mean and we're on the same. See, so one of the most interesting things I saw in our industry over the last 25 years is, um, you know, for those of you who have read uh, Eric Reese's Lean Startup, right? Um, it's a good book. I mean, Jez wrote Lean Enterprise. It's an excellent book. Um, just humble. Um, but the, uh, the thing is that I saw this in place. I, I'll just say it was years ago, but... Uh, GE, I saw Beth Comstack was the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer in an Eric Ries fireside chat at one of his conferences. And when she was talking about, we have gone head to toe on lean startup, you know, we think in terms of pivots, build, measure, learn, all the things around that. 
Uh, if you had, it's a great book if you hadn't read it. Um, and, and, and then I actually, about a month later, I was doing a cloud implementation for what I would say were the grunts, like the people at the edge who had to implement um, an on, you know, on-prem private cloud, right? And uh, one of my startups, right? And like they were using the same exact term, you know, fluently that Beth Comstack was using, the CMO. They were talking about pivot. And I realized that organization had reasonably successfully created a common taxonomy around lean enterprise, which again, the, the, the butterfly effect of toil, of mis taxonomy, like somebody should do a study on it. Um, also common models, um, I won't go, t I don't have too much time to go too deep in this. I think team topologies um, is just an amazing book. Uh, I use it like almost wrote as suggestions for models, uh, cognitive load, uh, team APIs, which is not like programmatic APIs, but APIs in terms of describing your team to other teams. Uh, roles and responsibilities, um, you know, we're, um, if you haven't, you, if you've been following this, what we're doing, so Jabe and, and commenting and three economies and how we think about platforms and platforms interface, outcome-based metrics, automation, skills liquidity, like this is a real, like it's one thing to think about skills updates, right? But how do I build, you know, there's sort of the, you know, we, we talk about um, T-shaped, um, you know, I-shaped, T-shaped, E-shaped individuals, right? Um, you know, I shape is I'm an Oracle DBA. T shape is I know Python. I, I, I'm a real expert on Oracle, but I also know MySQL. Um, and um, and then E shape is I'm sort of like pretty much can bounce just about anywhere within reason, right? Um, so understanding that the uh, a sort of a measure of your skills liquidity is a measure of your performance, which actually helps the said topic, digital transformation. Um, all right, so taxonomies and models, uh, you know, so then I go through, uh, like, okay, now I start grounding um, the opportunities, you know, so team topologies, maybe maybe SRE is right for you, right? A lot of times people are, I can do a whole presentation on the uh, toil of discussing and thinking about SRE in the enterprise, <laughs> right? Uh, so some questions are like, just stop talking about SRE in 2020 and you will save a ton of time. Um, team topologies, there's some workbooks, uh, we'll make this available. Uh, we have an open practice library at Red Hat that there's some really good stuff there that um, so I've been going through and looking at like what are some of the um, areas that we have, uh, roles and responsibility. Um, you've probably seen, again, uh, Diane could probably point a list of like Andrew's uh, five elements that we've been talking about in the GTO group. Uh, so five elements. Um, understanding the difference between value stream analysis and value chain analysis. So again, I don't start with these tools, but once we understand how to fit them in a roadmap that actually makes sense, then actually these tools become incredibly effective. And and just quite frankly, the, the value stream mapping is typically around your sort of lean value stream mapping. Value chain mapping is uh, sort of things like uh, Wardly mapping, if you're not familiar with that, right? And then again, a skills liquidity, open practice. There's some great books. Uh, IT Revolution. I mentioned the couple that I worked on over the years. Is uh, I think Gene said they produced like 50 or something. I, I counted like 30 or something, but I don't, who knows? Um, IT Revolution. These are all Creative Commons, um, so you can just go to IT Revolution forum papers. There's a Value Stream Architect. There's a Transformational Leader Quicker. These are great guides. And again, the Open Practice Library. Um, Platform transformation, you know. Uh, so here's an interesting thing too. I think um, what's important when we talk about platform, you know, so there's a lot of discussion about uh, project to product. Like right? Mick Kirsten has an excellent book, Product. I'll, I'll show you the reference, right? Um, and you know, and and yes, yeah, of course, like we need to move from to product. But then I'm like, okay, that's great, but not good enough. What about product to service? What about service to platform? And then where does sort of the cab and change management? So I think there's a there's sort of an evolution of you know project to product, product to service, platform as an interface as I discussed earlier, infrastructure scale, and then sort of operations. So how do you sort of look at these things? Again, normally when I'm reviewing this customer, we're doing a lot, you know, a lot more sort of education. A lot of cases it turns into a workshop. The three economies, platform by design, um, and um, and so in change management, like you know how you know like how do I sort of get sort of scale out um, from centralized to local authority, unified backlog, cab correlation, sectional debt. Um, and then here, you know, so looking at, I find in some of the large institutional banks, like they spend up to 40% of waste 
around non-functional requirements related to service management, which by the way, I call that a negative risk ROI. In other words, if you're spending a ridiculous amount of percentage of your time, like I've had examples where it takes me two weeks, John, to code this application. It takes me another eight weeks to go through all the sort of spreadsheets and forms and all these things, all related to um, you know, serviceability, reliability, or service management. And by the way, none of that actually made the service more, um, you know, more uh, reliant. And then even worse, a, a, an audit is just, you know, even though you pass the audit, it's completely disconnected to how that works. Um, and then, so there's a number of books here um, that from IT Revolution Press, um, Dominic Diagranis, if you haven't read uh, Making Work Visible, it's an incredibly good book. Again, it's one of those books I say is like, I always want to be clear, this is an amazing book, but I think you need to do the qualitative data analysis first. You know, it's where you guys are five thieves of time. It's brilliant. Uh, Mick Kirsten's product, the pro, uh, project, the product. Again, the Open Practice Library will make this available. Metrics, we talked about the the Magic Four. Now, I will say this again. Um, you know, I think that the work done by Dora and all has been incredible for our industry. It's led us down the the first. You know, um, you know, the the they used to the Nicole used to say we're sciencing the SH whatever out of DevOps, which is brilliant, right? And um, and I think if you don't are not doing any outcome based stuff, you should at least be doing these magic four, the, the, the common metrics. But they are lagging indicators. And so um, one of the things I really like is this concept of flow metrics because I think they're more leading indicators. They, they you know, the you know anyway, I like I'm gonna run out of time. But um, you know, like for example, if I look at lead time, I'm looking at sort of maybe depending on how you measure it, as long as it's consistent, I don't care, but let's say commit to to, to prod, right? Um, but the, um, so I, I, I start looking at in the aggregate, like I, I lose some efficacy because like, I, you know, one took you know, eight hours, but I don't know the explanation. Like I had a bunch and I had a bunch that were sort of lead time was relatively short under an hour. Um, and then all of a sudden I got one that's like eight hours or on Tuesday, Monday to whatever, right? You still get the point on Tuesday, everything averages like six hours, but you know, every other day it's like, you know, 48 minutes. Um, I don't know what's going on there. Like with flow metrics, um, look it up. It allows me to look at the wait time in between. And so I'm analyzing, so. Um, outcome, there's a great, a uh, bunch of great publications. Um, again, IT Revolution, Practice Library from Red Hat. Automation, of course, you would imagine we were pretty high on, uh, on Ansible. Uh, but then we have some trusted software supply chain. Um, the DevOps Automated Governance this is a book I worked on. I've been very heavily involved in this. I've done a lot of presentations. If you're interested, look it up. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, uh, I'll just say real quickly, it's a model for shortening audit time to either you know from 30 days to maybe a half a day, or maybe zero day. Uh, increases efficacy from maybe 25%. In other words, it's not it's secure moving from security and compliance theater to actually maybe 90% efficacy. And, and creates a real sort of roadmap to be able to reduce um, centralized uh, cab authority. Um, some great books that were precursors to the DevOps Automated Governance that we worked on, Dear Auditor, uh, uh, Unlike You, DevOps and Audit. Um, there's also a great paper that I presented about some uh, getting cloud providers to create uh, attestations to some of their infrastructure, for Automated Cloud Governance, OPL, um, Skills Liquidity, um, some of the things there are really important, like uh, you know, DevOps Dojo, big fan of that, internal hackathons, internal DevOps days, right? Again, these are good recommendations, except that if I learn that there's certain things about your organization where I'm like, you know what, you don't want to do internal DevOps days right now. Like maybe that's something you need to sort of fix this, fix this first. So that's the other thing is transformation isn't linear, right? Like there's multiple um, service and orgs within you know teams and team of teams and and orgs and you know like and um and then some are going to be at one cadence some are going to be another cadence so so again i i do think uh, that's where a qualitative approach to, helps you a lot uh skills liquidity there's a bunch of really good um tools out there for this um you know lean coffees if you haven't i love lean coffees in the enterprise it's um it's such a cheap way to create collaboration and and um, create sort of um, horizontal, you know, move sort of tribal knowledge to horizontal. 
which is, you know, just set them up on Wednesdays in the afternoon. You know, people, come. it's just, it, it's, it's a, it's a really easy way to get people sort of communicating in different groups or learning about other projects. Lunch shows and tells, um, good ideas. Um, demo days, you know, I think this works really good. It's, you know, everybody wins here. You know, people get to see. In most organizations that start out with demo days, when they're successful, um, I know one bank where like every week now, instead of just having rigid board meetings with the executives, half of the time is actually demo day. So now the board looks forward to weekly demo days about like how they've improved, um, how they sort of DevOps payments or, you know, uh, you know, so uh, guest lectures, you know, just keep your eye on it. You know, we, we like to speak. <laughs> Vendors love to send their people to speak. You know, if, if, um, if you're in uh, Chicago, you know, you're based in Chicago, you know, look on the agenda stuff and see, oh, look, so look, Adrian Krakow is, what is, uh, is speaking on Tuesday. I bet you he'd be, if I got him early enough, he might stick around for a day and come in. Like, I love doing that stuff, right? So, uh, inner source, right? Um, DevOps Dojo, um, the Dojo, again, we go on and on about Dojo. Um, I talked about the recommendations. There's some books. There's a great book that came out last year about getting started with Dojos, continuous learning. Um, well, safe to fail, right? These are things like uh, incident analysis. If you haven't been following John Ospar and the work he's doing, the adaptive uh, capacity labs, um, brilliant stuff. Uh, uh, understanding psychological safety, resilience engineers, uh, continuous verification. Uh, there's, uh, there's a couple of vendors now um, that are sort of moving chaos engineering into continuous verification, particularly with uh, Kafka, which is really interesting. If you want to know more about that, ping me. Uh, you know, flattening incident management, continuous verification, here's an example, uh, you know, sort of, it's really taking uh, chaos engineering to a higher level. Um, because, uh, anyway, so, uh, so there's actually a new book out by Casey Rosenthal uh, and Nora Jones, where Casey was involved in the Netflix engineering of the chaos engineering. Um, and again, some of the stuff we have on the open practice library. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it, man. That's uh, Bob's your uncle. Well, Bob's not my uncle, but <laughs> that, was, that was great. We have a, a couple of folks that are on Prasanna and Steven. If you guys have questions or thoughts about this, it's actually a really good talk following on the heels of the anticipatory awareness talk that Jabe did last week. Um, and I really appreciate um, you teasing out the ideas around mental models um, and and that and I combining that with uh, kind of what Jabe was saying about you know being aware of them and making sure um, that you you know, you have a common taxonomy for your and vocabulary when you're doing this work. I think that's yeah, you know, no, some of the really important, important. important. How much you you lose if you don't just simply try to sit down. I mean, the best experiment I ever saw was what, what GE did, right? Where they literally had everybody, you know, whether you like the lean startup model or not, it was like everybody was communicating with like acronyms and terms mm -hmm. and everybody knew exactly what it meant. So yeah. from the CMO down to the sort of lowest level engineer that was like literally configuring configuration files for, uh, you know, for one of the cl private clouds, like, they were speaking exactly the same language. There was a, another thing that we went through, and Stephen, if you have, uh, please unmute yourself and join in the conversation here, if you like. Um, back in the day when I was a baby um, product manager in startups, we all we made I made everybody go through pragmatic marketing, um, which was mm -hmm. a is is another way of getting everybody on the same page around personas and how you you know build out that and that I mean it's been around for like 10 or 15 years now so I'm pretty sure they're still in existence but it's like the whole idea of that um, you have to have a, a common vocabulary in order to do things like qualitative data analysis and I think that's really that's the work that goes in up front um, to, to well, before before you get there as well. Well, and then but well, but but to to, to sort of be clear, and the reason why I, I favor qualitative analysis is to unravel. Like I, you know, if I talk to hundred people and I realize that there are certain teams, like the database team, is calling using a term. Well, this is common everywhere. Like using a term, uh, you know, even I've had this even with. Um, Sort of Red Hat products, where some people would call it, um, 
you know, the um, self-service platform. Some people call it OpenShift. Some people call it Kubernetes, right? And depending on how far the drift was, you might not have been having the same conversation. So just yeah. getting everybody on the um, same. You remember when we did that? Um, this was public. We did that. Um, the Commons in in London, right? And it was the Deutsche Bank presentation where they gave their own name. They yep. came up with their own name for um for our product, right? And I thought that was brilliant, right? Because now you they've kind of sort of put their own little sort of marketing internal marketing spin on it. And now, you know, it was one word. Yep. So you didn't have scrap for like what are the five or six terms that even Red Hat uses for Kubernetes. Yeah, and then they take they take um you take more ownership of it too. Oh, I totally think. right. You have that um that's and and to be perfectly honest with you, um, although not um you know, not in our best interest as a vendor, but uh, you know, to, to the point I made to them is it gives them the ability to um uncouple themselves with a vendor. Mm hmm Oh yeah. You know, so that that's a positive for the consumer in that like if they do need to shift to another product, it's much easier if they just called it, you know, the orange banana or whatever, you know. So you have to be careful with that because there is a company X by Orange that I don't think they called it Banana, but they have. No, I know. Yeah, no, I, know, going, I, know, I, know mm. I know. The folks at Orange are doing really amazing things um, with OpenShift and all yeah, kinds Pat, of other yeah. pieces of uh, the cloud native ecosystem projects. They're, they're pretty amazing. Um, Stephen, is, is there anything that you wanted to ask or add? No, nah, I'm just I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of John's. I, we've 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 met a couple of times at DevOps days in Austin. So yeah, yeah, I, totally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, str I struggle with these conversations with my with my customers. I'm a I'm a solution architect in the energy pod down here in Houston, and um, I several of my different you know several clients that I have, several customers that I have are uh, in heavy regulated you know environments, right? They're they're utilities, they're right, uh, right, they're right. ISOs, they're running they're running data grids and things like that, and they have that. Highly regulated environment mentality of adopting change, right? And um, a lot of the times, it's it's very difficult because you know there's one customer that we have that we OpenShift is on you know on premise on site, and unfortunately they're bastardizing it to the point to where it's almost yeah. unusable, right? There's because they're basically lifting and shifting. Their old proven, auditable, you know, documented processes into this new platform, and they're literally they're getting some benefits out of it, uh, but it's it's very difficult. It's it's very difficult to um, to cautiously tell them, or you know, not and not to create a, an adversarial relationship, but to basically shake them and be like, "You're doing this wrong." <laughs> You know, you're you're you're. It's great that you got this new platform, but you're moving all of these antiquated old systems over because you don't know anything better, or you don't want to change because you have this built-in organizational knowledge of the products. You have organizational guarantees that if you use these approved products, you won't get in trouble. Type of mentality. There's a there's a really low trust environment there so i'm always looking at ways to a how you know how to start that conversation which doesn't turn into a you're doing it wrong conversation but then yeah. b how to how to move up the chain because i can talk to mid-level managers i can even talk to kind of director level but they don't have the organizational power to be able to affect change in those ways so i'm always trying to figure out like a, how to get the conversation going, and then B, how to make that conversation grow, go up, rather than than go down. Because I explain the concepts to them, and they all shake their head and they're like, "Oh yeah, that sounds great, but it won't work here." <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the you know again, there's no magic bullet, right? I mean, but I do find out of all the times I've spent over the years, you know, I mean, it seems I've always been on this you know, transformation sort of journey with clients. I think we all have, right? But going almost five generations of technology. And um and so I, I I sort of like come to the this, you know, conclusion at this point that um 
that you know the, the thing that we're always missing is understanding those sort of three things up front, which is there are these mental models, you know, that we can't go in too early with prescriptive solutions because we miss a lot of things. And um, you know, and then there's sort of like the, the thing you find, you know, I, I you know, I there's so many times I'll interview an organization that just spent two years going through sort of a big four recommended plan. And I'll ask them, did anybody talk to you from that, you know, big four organization? No. And if they would have, I would have told them that this wasn't going to work, that going to work. You know, so the, you know, people just, you know, like they're so tired of just like the sort of, you know, they, you know, they see it as, you know, oh, the CEO saw, you know, saw another poster in the airport. <laughs> Here we go again, you know. Um, you know, they, they just they, these things don't pass the smell test. And so when you sit down with them, and you allow to listen to they, I mean, they will not shut up. Typically, I find all I have to do is say to start a meeting with, you know, I used to think I had to do some timelining and boxes and very specific. I find now I just say, you know, what is your company not doing that it should be doing? And literally that, that you know, it just doesn't stop from there. And then I have to sort of drill in when I hear like a, I hear a trigger word, like something that's related to risk or consistency. I'll sort of well, what? Give me an example of that, right? But, but my point is that to the you know to your point that um, you know first this has to be mandated at the sea level, right? Um, because and then what you're doing then at that point is going back to them and then and quite honestly I had clients when I was not with Red Hat where they didn't like the data. You know, they wanted to ignore it, you know, and, and uh, that's their prerogative. You know, back then I would say, you know, well, you know, I, I'd actually say to them, say, you're not going to like the output of this. And, oh, no, John, no, we want to know the truth about everything. You know, we're sort of, and then you tell them and they like to see how it actually gets mad at you. Right. And, you know, and then, you know, and like, and then I say, like, kind of, I don't say I told you so, but I'm like, hey, one of the things I tell you in the beginning, you're not going to like the data, but you're going to pay me anyway. <laughs> Like, it, just because you don't like the data doesn't mean you're not going to get invoiced. And then, um, you know, and then at the end, I'm like, you know, I mean, if you don't like, here's it, this is it, you know. And by the way, it's not me, it's your people. And by the way, if you, you know, one other thing I always like to say to them too is, okay, do me a favor. Because people, like, you feel, I don't, you know, the thing is, I don't think a lot of us sort of, we know this, but we don't remind ourselves. All the people we work with, our clients, most of them, wake up in the morning wanting to do a good job, right? We Sometimes we get lost in the mire, like we think everybody's sort of, oh, nobody, there's bad actors. Truth is, the majority of people that go to work want to do a good job, right? And um, But we put these barriers in their way to do that good job, right? And and so now all of a sudden, like, they're told, oh, you know, you got to go listen to this guy. And then immediately they think I'm like, you know, if they don't know who I am, then like, oh, here we go, another Bob from Office Space, right? And and then, um, you know, and, and then at some point I win their trust, right? Like, because they realize, you know, I give them the speech that I'm, you know, I'm here just to collect data. But John, are you going to fix anything? I don't know. I'm going to basically, I'm going to, I'm going to do some analysis and tell the executives what you tell me. <laughs> so, you know, the fact that they invested in me doing this is a good sign, you know, because the other eight people I talked to said they didn't want to do this. Uh, but near the end, they get to this like, oh, you know, they get excited. You see them like wanting, oh, let me let me tell you about this. Let me, t and it's not like they're trying to like bash their organization. They're like, you know, and then you get, and then when they know it's getting near an end, when I do any on prem, there's almost this like sadness, like, like oh, he's leaving, and then they're like, but John, is it gonna fix anything? So normally I go back to CIO, and if the CIO is like not receptive to like all the, you know, I've had. CIOs get fired while I'm in the middle of the process, and new CIOs like, I don't know, I'm going to do this, this, and this before I do that. I'm like, all right, I, I beg you, you, do one thing. Like, pick two things out of this list of 15 and just do it. Pick the two most harmless things that you think there are, because if you don't do anything from this report, and all these people spent, you know, basically, um, you know, a couple of hundred hours with me, they're just going to throw me into that same old category of like nothing changes every time i have to talk to one of these people nothing changes i'm like do something like just show them you know that even if you think it's a throwaway idea just at least give them a bone to say like you know um that you know you are listening because again i think people just get to the wits end of like you know there's things that are wrong here 
I know they're wrong. I won't, you know, I'll, I'll say one more. I know we're running out of time, but sometimes when I get somebody on a long rant, I'll say, hey, why do you work here? And it'll, it'll throw them completely out of, out of, you know, out of, you know, off, you know, off guard. Yeah. And then normally the answer is, I like it here. You know, there'll be like a five second delay where they got to think, right? Like, uh, and I'm like, I like it here. I like the people. I just wish we could fix these things. Anyway. Yeah, we can fix the things. We have to listen to each other too. I think that's really yeah, it. And yeah. hearing people, that's it. So. My last question is the, uh, the the Global Transformation Office, you and Andrew and Kevin, and is there a is there a, a set of engagement? Like, how do I get y'all's capabilities in front of my customers? Is it a is it a, a set of documentation to where it's like, here's all of our capabilities? Are you interested? Yeah, in it's, I I'll say this. Um, you know, there's sort of two answers. One is, um, you know, any one of us in a pinch could be pulled in for just about any conversation. So this brings me back to before we started today's recording, um, creating the landing page on how to contact you. Yeah, 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 um, we need to and, do that. And this is something that you and I and the the team need need to need to get that stood up along with all the, the the presentations you guys have been doing on these Transformation Fridays. So um, here's my commitment to reaching out and pinging you guys again to do that. And um, Stephen, thank you for the uh, instigation um, to do that. So. Um... <music>